Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you, and uh, so glad that you are, wa- are watching tonight, and uh, hope that you enjoyed Mark's program. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of the same things, I believe, uh, from what I heard, at least t- touching on some of these things. Uh, actually, tonight, tonight we are going to, uh, I think, give you something uh, that is very informative and interesting probably something that you don't get to see too often, if ever, and that is we're going to let a man preach his own funeral. I first want to give you our content information in case you'd like to worship with us or study the Bible with us. Uh, We meet at 250 the Boulevard there in Eden. My phone number is 276-340-2653, or you can reach me at 336 394 Five seven two one. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is my email address, and of course, uh, awftldvd at gmail.com. If you would like a, a copy of the programs, uh, any of our uh, things that we do, we'll try to get those out to you just as, as uh, quickly as we can. But if you're in the area, we hope that you will visit with us. Also, if you're in the area of Martinsville or Danville, here's how you can meet with the saints there at 823 Starling Avenue. In Martinsville, they meet on Sundays at uh, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, they have a, a, a uh, service at 9, then class at 10, and their worship is at 11. Also, uh, the folks in Danville, they meet at uh, is it 10 and 11, Mark? Yeah. Uh, 10 and 11, they're at 120 American Legion, and uh, we meet at 9 and 10 in Eden. And I want to remind you also of uh, what does the Bible say that comes on Sunday nights at 8.30 and also on uh, Tuesday nights uh, for those who watch online on WHIG uh, out of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. You might just Google that, and, and I don't have the, the link up for you, but uh, Brother Johnny Robertson is doing a TV program down there as well. And so uh, we hope that you will. Uh, uh, check that out and uh, and support that as well with your with your uh, viewing. You know, friends, one of the things that just comes with life, I suppose, is preaching a funeral, going to funerals, and it's not something that people uh, look forward to, obviously, but it is a fact of life. It is something that simply. Uh, has to be done. I mean, people are going to die. Death is part of life. And so uh, it is usually the time when people uh, want a preacher or someone to preach the funeral. Now, what is the purpose of preaching a funeral? You know, I suppose if you ask people why they would preach a funeral, you'd get a number of different answers. But for me as a gospel preacher, there's one purpose in preaching a funeral. And that is to give some information that God wants you to hear. I know there's a lot of individuals that probably don't look that way and uh, don't view it as such. Even members of the church may not uh, look at it as like that. But nonetheless, I believe it is my responsibility and duty to do that very thing. So if you were to ask me to preach a funeral, this is likely what I would say, something along these lines. I have preached a number of funerals since I've been up in this area. I've preached several before I even came up in this area, but I've been up here for, um, well, since 99, however long that's been. I'm losing count, losing track. Uh, I guess it's about 12 years now. And uh, I think I've probably preached a, a, a funeral uh, one, one per year on average, I suppose. But what is the purpose? Well, Every every sermon, every sermon I've ever preached at a funeral has the same theme, same idea, same objective. And that is to get the family and friends to take note of something that they otherwise might forget. You know, when you think about uh, the way preachers operate, a lot of preachers use the calendar or they use Hallmark to dictate what they preach. You know, if it's Mother's Day, they get, a, they get a sermon on Mother's. And if it's Father's Day, they get a sermon on Father's Day. And if it's, you know, I don't know, National Secretary's Week, they give, 
you know, maybe they preach a sermon about secretaries. I, I don't know. But funerals are definitely an occasion where you can present something from God's Word and know for certain that everybody there is going to have their mind on that subject. And that subject is death. Now, friends, I want you to consider this. If I were to preach your funeral, I would say something like this. I would remind you that funerals do have an upside. Now, obviously, it's hard to find the good in such a tragedy and death and loss, but funerals do have a good sign. In Ecclesiastes 7, verses 1 through 4, I want you to consider what Solomon said about funerals, if you would. In Ecclesiastes 1, verses, uh, excuse me, Ecclesiastes 7, verses 1 through 4. He said, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of one's death than the day of one's birth. Now, the day of death is better than the day of birth? Now, consider what he said. He said, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of the fools is in the house of mirth. You know, friends, it is one thing to live a life that is full of laughter and joy and carefree. But one thing that everybody has to consider, the most happiest person has to consider or should consider that death is coming for us all. Now Solomon looked at this occasion. He said, you know what? It's better to be in the house of mourning because the living will take it to heart. Every person who's ever been to a funeral thinks about death. They realize one day it's going to be my turn. Funerals serve as an occasion to remind us of how frail we are, how short life is, how uncertain life is. So if I were to preach your funeral, I would, I would start off with something like this, reminding you that this is actually something that, that can serve a good purpose. Now, you may say, well, I don't, I don't see the good in this. Well, here's why. If you are thinking about death, then you're going to be reminded that we are, all are going to have an appointment with death. Hebrews 9, verse 27. As it is appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So everybody has an appointment with death. Now, you say, well, James... What's good in that? That sounds very down and depressing. And surely, if you're going to talk to the living at a funeral, you want to give them some hope. That's exactly what I want to give you. If I were to preach your funeral, I might say something like this. You know, death is common. I think it's good to show that what has happened on an occasion of a loss of a loved one is not something that is really unusual. Now, maybe the circumstances may be unusual, tragic deaths and so forth, but death is common. Moses spoke of death as the common death of all men there in Numbers chapter 16, verse 29. And David and Joshua both called death the way of all the earth. Everybody's going to die. Everybody's going to die. Everybody has an appointment with death. As a matter of fact, listen to what Job said. Job 30, verse 23, he says, For I know that thou wilt bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. And then the psalmist says in Psalm 89, verse 48, he says, What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Now, friends, there's nothing you can do to stop the inevitable. The only chance that we have of leaving this life, leaving this world without going through the death is if the Lord returns before we die. But other than that, everybody is appointed to death. So it's, it's really, in a way, it's good to see that, you know, this is not something that is hurting just you. But here's something else. Death has a cause. Now, stop and think about this. Oftentimes people say, God took my loved one. God took 
mama, daddy, grandmother, grand, grandfather. And they use that occasion to really blame God. But friends, that's the devil's lie. If I were to preach your funeral, I would tell you not to believe the devil's lie. God wants man to live forever. He wanted man to live forever. I mean, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9, if you consider, if you consider in God's wisdom or his, if you consider in God's uh, uh, blessings what he put in the garden, you'll notice that he put in the midst of the garden a certain tree. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight of sight and good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now the tree that God put in the midst of the garden was not the tree of death, but the tree of life. It was always God's plan. If you go back to the beginning, you'll find God's plan. God's plan is evidenced in the creation. And for example, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, indicating what God's plan was all along for marriage? That is one man and one woman for life. That was always God's plan. So you can also see God's plan in man living forever. He gave him the tree of life. So death then must not be part of God's plan. It must not be part of God's uh, scheme. What I would want you to know is that Satan is behind death. He just wants us to blame God, see? Satan is looking for a reason or he's looking for a way to get man to say God is the culprit. You know, I talk to a lot of people uh, or hear, hear these arguments from people who are agnostics or atheists and, and you know, one of the things they often bring up is, well, the, there's the problem of evil. If God is so good, how come there's so much evil in the world? Well, by definition, if you have good, you're going to have evil. But there's no need to blame the good for the evil. Consider this. Satan is the one who's behind death. Now notice this. In Job 1, in Job chapter 1, you'll find that Job has children. All right? There's a man in the land of us whose name was Job. He was perfect, an upright man, one that feared God and shewed evil. All right, so Job was, was an upright man, and he had all this wealth. He had all these camels and, and sheep and so forth, and, he, and, and ten, ten children, seven uh, boys and three girls. And uh, let's begin reading in verse 6 here. And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, uh, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and sheweth evil? And Satan said, answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? For thou hast, for not, hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land, but... Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. Now look, friends, remember it was in Satan's power. And what is the power that Satan uses? In every occasion, in every occasion, whether it would be uh, uh, when the, uh, the messenger comes and tells Job about his oxen. He said the oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away and have slain the servants. Now, there's the death. There's death involved. Who's behind it? Satan. Uh, let's come back to verse 16. While he was yet speaking, there came another, and the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. Now, what happened here? Here's death. And who's behind it? Satan. Verse 18, and while he was yet speaking, there also came another and said, the sons, Thy sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness 
and smote the four corners of the house that it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. Now, who's behind the death? Who's behind the death? Satan's behind it. We know because we're reading the book. But Job doesn't know this. As a matter of fact, let's go back to verse 16. Notice what Satan does. In order to reinforce in Job's mind that God is the one who's doing this, listen to what the messenger says as he comes to Job. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and hath consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. You see, Satan wants man to look at what's going on and say, God's to blame. And he certainly wants that to happen with death. So if I were to preach your funeral, if I were to preach your funeral, I would remind people that you know what? Satan is the one behind death. Satan is the one who has the power of death. As a matter of fact, death is an enemy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 25 and 26, uh, the Bible tells us then come at the end when Christ will have given up all power and he will put, he will reign till he has put uh, all, thing, all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, if death is an enemy, why would Christ, or if death is not an enemy, if it's actually a power of God, then why would Christ destroy it? Why would he put it down? Why would Paul call it an enemy? See, friends, death and God are not on the same side. As a matter of fact, if they were, then there would be a house divided. And Jesus said in Mark 3 and verse 25, you know, house divided cannot stand. If God is destroying his own power, then certainly there is no, no stability there. So death is not in God's camp. Death is in Satan's camp. As a matter of fact, listen what the Bible says about death and Satan. In Hebrews 2 verse 14, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So when you go to a house of mourning, when you go to the, the funeral home, when you are, are attending that, that, uh, th that, that funeral, here's one thing you got to remember, is that the departure of a loved one is Satan's attempt to get you to separate yourself from God, blame God, turn from God. That's what he would want. But see, Satan is really behind death. He would want you to blame God, but yet that's not what we know. See, death, now we get an occasion to talk about death. And we start to see that, that death has a cause and, and, and it's Satan who's behind it. But friends, there's something else you need to know. Death has been conquered. Now here's where the hope really lies. If I were to preach your funeral, this is what you'd hear, something like this. You would hear death has been conquered. Now, friends, God has a way of using bad things to turn them to good. In Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, Joe, uh, Joseph is talking to his brethren, and he reminds them that they sold him into slavery. They sold him down to the Egyptian bondage. Yet God had favor upon Joseph, and he rose through the ranks, and he became the second, uh, only, second in Egypt, only to, second only to the Pharaoh. And he says this, after his father died, they're, they're scared. And Joseph says this to his brother. He says, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Friends, that's exactly what Satan wants us to look at death or how he wants us to look at death. He wants us to see death as something that God has done and instead I would encourage you to look at death as a good thing, as a recognition of the fact that, you know what? If God is more powerful than Satan, then certainly, certainly God is going to have the ability to destroy Satan's powers. Certainly it's going to be the case that, that uh, if, if death can be destroyed, if death is an enemy... God has a way to defeat it. How is that? Well, God uses Satan's tools against himself. God takes death, which is the power of the devil, 
And he says, you know what? I'm going to defeat the devil with his own power. I'm going to defeat the devil in his own game. Now watch how he does this. Jesus used death to defeat Satan. Look again at Hebrews 2 and verse 14. Hebrews 2 and verse 14. Here is what the Hebrew writer says. He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So in God's plan, God says, you know what? I'll use death and I'll destroy the devil and death at the same time. So what was God's plan? What was God's plan that he was going to put in place that would defeat the devil? Well, here's how he did it. God loosed death. Notice this. Notice this. Well, let me back up one. First Corinthians 15, verses 54 through 55. So he took away the sting. Now, friends, if Jesus hadn't defeated death, if he hadn't been raised again, there would be no hope. There'd be no hope. But Christ died and then rose again, and that is how Paul is able to say in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, death is swallowed up in victory. O grave, where is thy sting? O, gra o, uh, o death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? See, Christ conquered death. Christ conquered death. And here's how he did it. Here's how he did it. He died and came back to life. In Acts chapter 2, verse 24, Acts 2 and verse 24, Listen to what Peter says. Uh, let's, let's come on up to verse 22. Acts 2, 22. You men of Israel hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom, speaking of Christ, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Christ was not going to stay in the grave, friends. That is how God defeated Satan. That's how death was conquered. Death was conquered when Satan killed Christ through the wicked hands of the Jews and God then raised Christ up again. Now that is how death was defeated. That's how death was defeated. Now you might say, well, how did Christ defeat death uh, or, or how, does that, how does that even give us hope? Well, the devil doesn't want us to realize that God is power, more powerful than, than, than death. He wants us to think that, that God is uh, not able to defeat death, and so death is the scary uh, part of life that we are cowering from. Well, friend, have you stopped to think that Christ defeated death? Satan wants us to give up because he does, and he doesn't want us to know how to defeat death. He doesn't want us to know how to conquer death. You know, it's like that secret uh, weapon that the enemy has. But when the flaw is revealed, the enemy tries to cover it up. The enemy tries to cover up the flaw because he knows that if everybody knows the secret, then the weapon is no longer powerful. You know, it's it's like if the uh, if uh, uh, if if the werewolf sees the silver bullet or gets shot with a silver bullet, you know that that's his end. Or if a vampire sees the daylight or whatever it may be, that's just that's just his uh, his weakness. And the devil knows that if you know the truth about how God conquered death, you won't be afraid of death. You won't be worried about death. So how did God conquer death? Well, look again. 
Christ died, he was raised, or Christ died, he was buried, and he was raised again. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians I'm sorry, chapter 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. How did Christ defeat death? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. By which also you are saved. Look, you're saved. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Now there's death. And he was buried. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, when Christ was dead, buried, then he was raised again. And that is when God said, This day you're my beloved son. This is, day, this is the day I've begotten you. Acts 13.33 You see, Christ raised from the dead was the victory over death. Continue looking at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26. Look what Paul says. Paul says, here's how important it is that Christ be raised from the dead. Now friends, I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you some hope in the face of death. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He put all things under his feet. Uh, I'm sorry. Let, let's come down to verse. Uh, First Corinthians. Sorry, First Corinthians fifteen sixteen. If the dead rise not, then Christ then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Now you see how important it is that Christ defeated death? If Christ died and wasn't raised again, if death beat Christ, there's no hope. Verse 18, Paul says, Then ye are also which are asleep, fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we of all men are most miserable. If Christ isn't raised, then being a Christian is really not worth anything. If Christ be not raised, there's no hope of anything after this life. So death is victorious. But yet we know Christ defeated death. He was raised from the dead. That's what gives us hope. Now you say, James, I know Christ died and he was buried and he was raised. How then do we defeat death? How do we defeat death? Well, let's look at this. In Romans chapter 6, and let's just start in verse 1. Paul said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now, how did Christ defeat death? He died. Okay. Then Paul says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now, how did Christ defeat death? He died. And he was buried. Then Paul says that like as Christ was raised from the dead, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So Christ defeated death by being dead, put to death, being buried, and then raised again. And Paul says those are the same things that we do when we obey the gospel. We die with Christ in baptism. We're buried with Christ in baptism. And then we're raised with Christ in baptism. 
to walk in newness of life. The new life starts after baptism. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, if Christ defeated death when he was raised, friends, I'd like to know how is it that some people say that you're saved, that you have a new life, before you even die and are buried in baptism. See, the way Christ conquered death, he laid the pattern out that we should follow. He laid the pattern out. This is how we can conquer death. It is by dying, being buried, and being raised again from the watery grave of baptism. Now, friends, here's what Jesus did when he died. Jesus did something other than just defeat death when he died. You know what he did? He made it possible, he made it possible to establish his church. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. It's Christ's, Christ's church, belongs to him. It's the church of Christ. He says, Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of Hell, now that's, that's not fire and brimstone. That's death. That's Hades. That's the grave. Shall not prevail against it. Now, the reason why Christ said this is because he knew. He knew that when he died and when he was buried, he was going to be raised again. He was not going to stay in the grave. He was not going to stay in the ground because he knew that he was going to be raised again. And that's why, and that's why we have uh, uh, Peter saying about, Dave, uh, uh, saying about Christ through David. He's quoting David. David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on the right hand of God that he should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Jesus did not stay in the grave long enough to start decaying. David saw that. He said, I know that he's going to be raised again. I know I can see the resurrection. Now, friends, that is how Jesus defeated death. And that's why he said, I'll build my church after I die because the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell won't stop me. Now, friends, death is something that we can say, you know what, this is good. This is good. Jesus defeated death and he paved the way for us. Now, friends, when someone tells you, when someone tells you, something that's not in the Bible as far as concerning your soul's salvation, you know what they're doing? They're actually telling you a way in which you cannot defeat death. They're not telling you the true way to defeat death. When people say, say the sinner's prayer, or when they tell you, well, you just ask Jesus to come into your heart, those things are not in the Bible. That's not the pattern that we should follow to defeat death. Now, friends, when I go to the house of mourning, when I go to a funeral home, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking, one day I'm going to be there. And I want to know how to prepare for this day so that in the end I can live again. And the only way I do that is follow the pattern. Jesus is the only one who's ever defeated death and not died again. Do you think about that? Jesus is the only person who has died and been raised again, never to die again. You say, well, James Lazarus died, and he was raised again. Jesus called him forth out of the grave. That's right. And he died again, too. But you know what? If you prepare for death the way Christ did, if you die with Christ, if you're buried with Christ, if you're raised again with Christ, and that all happens in baptism, guess what? you're going to be added to the church that Christ built after he died. Now, friends, I know this. I know that these churches of men 
are not part of God's plan to prepare you for death. You know how I know that? Because none of them were established by Christ. They weren't established by Christ after he died, like he established his church. Matter of fact, they weren't even established by Christ before he died. He didn't think, any, he didn't think enough of them to even talk about them before or after his death. But his church that he established, he established on the principle that I'm going to raise from the dead. Then I'm going to build it. That's why it's so important, friends. His church was built after he died and rose again. So that is why when you read about people in Acts chapter 2 who, who have been saved, guess where they're placed? In Acts 2 verse 47, the Bible says, that they were, that the saved were added to the church daily. The church was where God put all the saved people. Now, if you want to defeat death, if you want to be victorious over death the way Christ was, then you need to follow that pattern that he followed. Follow his example. He's the one who conquered death. He knows how to conquer death. Why don't you do the same thing? But preachers today won't tell you that. I heard Brother Mark talking about uh, the funeral service of our Brother Alverson. And the man who preached that funeral said that Billy wanted everybody to learn about salvation. But he didn't tell them what the Bible said about salvation. Now, friends, that's like someone telling you, that's like someone saying, I want you to learn how to defeat death, but then don't turn around and don't tell you how to defeat it. That's like asking someone a question and then they never answer it. At least they don't answer it truthfully. And so when someone says, well, Brother Billy Alverson wanted salvation talk, and he wanted, to know, he wanted everybody to know what to do to be saved. I agree with that. But what the people at that funeral heard was not the truth. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, what Mr. Davies said was not what Billy Alverson obeyed. And I'm going to let Billy preach his own funeral. You know, I'm telling you, this is what I would preach if I preached your funeral. You know, there's not much you can do about your own funeral once you're the one who's passed. Once you're the one who's faced death, there's not much you can do about it. So I'm telling you what I would do if I, could, if I preached your funeral. Now, what happens at my funeral? I have my wishes laid out. But I can't guarantee you with 100% certainty that that's going to happen. But what I'm going to do is let you hear Brother Alverson. We're just going to let Billy preach his own funeral. Because people can say, well, this is what Billy wanted. And other people say, well, this is what he wanted. This is what Billy believed. And others, this is what Billy believed. Well, I say, I just let Billy do his own talking for him. I do want to say this. I find it very interesting that the people who usually say that the church is not important make sure that they try to claim someone who has died. This was the obituary. It says that Billy was a member of the Commerce Chapel Baptist Church, but he had recently joined the Church of Christ. Friends, I tell you this. Brother Billy Alverson was added to the Church of Christ just like the Bible says, the Lord added to the church. And with 110% certainty, Brother Billy was not a member of the Baptist church. Now, I'm going to let him speak for it. Listen, I love Brother Billy Iverson. First time I went out to his house, I knew I'd found a friend. 
And friends, I don't have friends when it comes to preaching the truth. By the way, if you read the obituary, it says it calls me Reverend Oldfield. I'm not Reverend. I just want to say that. And I understand, you know, misunderstandings or typos, whatever, but I just want to get that out there. But I want you to know this. The brother Billy Alverson knew what he obeyed. He knew what he obeyed. Some of you have seen these commercials that we've played we've made with Brother Billy uh, from last year. We use them in our tent promos and our TV programs and so forth. And I want to play some more of that interview for you and just let you hear from Billy's own words what he believed. Everybody talked about how he was always talking about his beliefs and what he would say to people and how much he loved the Bible and studying the Bible. And all those things are true. But you're going to hear some things that maybe you may not have heard anywhere else. So, Scotty, I'm going to ask you to drop me from the screen, and we're just going to let Brother Billy Alverson preach his own funeral. Can you hear it? A long time, years and years. In the Bay Church, years and years. In the Bay Church, years and years. But I'm in the Bay Church, years and years. But I'm in the Bay Church. I'm Billy Alverson. Billy Alverson. And uh, I'm Billy Alverson. How old are you, Billy? 83. How old are you, Billy? 83. 83. And what religious group were you with? 83. What church were you in? The church. Well, I was in the B church. What religion were you in? The church. I was in the B church. What church? The B church. I was in the B church. What church? The B church. I was in the B church. What church? The B church. I was in the B church. What church? The B church. I was in the B church. But I found out the B church. Were you with? What I'm church with, were you in for a long time? The church you with? I well, I was in. What I'm church were you in for a long time? The church you with? I well, I was in. What church were you in for a long time? The church you with? I well, I was in. But I found out one night, but I found out uh, five or six one years night, ago, maybe long. But I found I out uh, five or six years ago, maybe long. But I found out five or six years ago, maybe long. But I found out five or six years ago, maybe long. But I found out couldn't find it. Five or six years ago, maybe long.
What family church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in for a long time? The church of Christ. I well, I was in the beat. What church were you in
But he so will Bounty Select the size. It's the smaller, powerful sheet. It's the only one with trap and lock technology. Look, one I select the size sheet of Bounty is 50% more absorbent than a full size sheet of the leading... And I, and I would... Uh, I'd ask a lot of questions, and I later made a lot of comments when... Uh, but... Uh, but he was dissatisfied too, and he left. And he's not that ch in that church anymore. His wife still goes there, but he's not uh, with them anymore. I don't know. He's uh, he's kind of set in his ways in the the, uh, the man-made churches, and uh, I'm totally out of it now, James. I used to be, but I'm totally out of it now. And uh, uh, I know that... Uh Tell me your name. I'm Billy Alverson. Billy Alverson. And, uh... How old are you, Billy? Eighty-three. 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 What, um, what religious group were you with? What I'm church with, were you in for uh, a long time? The, the Church of Christ. I, well, I was in the B Church for a long time, years and years. The what church? The B Church. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, hey. uh, but I found out one night, uh, five or six years ago, maybe longer, I don't know, I was hunting for something on the television and uh, couldn't find anything, so I, I happened to go to this little reasonable channel down here, this channel five. And uh, uh, Johnny was on, Johnny Roberts was on at uh, Marsville, and I, I got interested in him, and he was, everything he was saying, he was taking from the Bible and flashing it up on the screen. So I grabbed my Bible and tried to follow him, and he was showing me things that I didn't know uh, and so I got to, got to thinking about this thing, and he was telling me the truth, but it wasn't jiving with what I had been taught. And I'd been misled, I think, for years. And then, at kind of at the end of his show, you know, he put his telephone number up where I could call and talk with him and converse and, and say, hey, if I had a comment that was bad or a good one, I could make it. And I said, you know, these other, well, it's a lot of these fellas that talk and you can't talk to them. There's no way you can get to talk with them. But I like that, and so I couldn't wait till the next Sunday night when he came on, and then he got to talking about uh, he talked about you and James Oldfield, and so then I got interested in that. And between the two, I look forward to Thursday night and Sunday night. And so uh, then I, I thought about it and thought about it. Continued to go to church. Was unhappy. Was plum dissatisfied because I knew I was being taught wrong. And I talked to some people, and the only reason I kept going was I had a Sunday school teacher that I really thought the world of. But he left our church too, and so when he left, I kind of left. My wife continued to go, but she was unhappy. She wasn't as satisfied. And, but uh, it's some experiences and it's like I've come to the conclusion that I was I was taught falsely and I believe I think 
I, well, back when I started, with a, like I first mentioned, when I, I got to know uh, Johnny and you, I feel like I started studying my Bible more. And the more I studied it, the more I wanted to study it, and the more I found out that I had been misled. And uh, what caused you to start studying more? What did, were you? It was it was the true meaning and the feeling that I knew I was lost. Did it I was make you mad, I, I was baptized. Well. <laughs> You'd hate to say you got mad, but you really get aggravated. It was, you know, I knew that all of this stuff that we had been, uh, you know, we had been going through. Uh, it was, uh, it, it was not truth, and it was so much of the stuff that uh, that, well, the, the things that's taught on a lot of these. It's churches today, these man-made churches, they are taught what people want to hear. This hour, this is where uh, the Burlington Police Department announced that two young men have been charged with robbing a motel that happened back in August of 2012. Charged by Burlington Police Officers 17-year-old Rodney Kyle Corbett of Krause Lane in Burlington and also charged a juvenile, both charged with armed robbery in this case. It goes back to August the 26th of 2012. Burlington police learned that an armed robbery had happened at the courtyard by Marriott located on Wilson Drive in Burlington. According to the Burlington Police Department, officers arrived on the scene and discovered that two men had entered the business and approached an employee and then demanded money.